Hi, I'd like to welcome um, everyone this afternoon. This is Nancy Marchand Martella, and I'm also joined by Ronald Martella. Hello. And I'm going to be the primary presenter today, um, and Ron will uh, add um, information as we go through, um, if he wants to, of course, and then when we have questions, which uh, I really do encourage you to um, provide questions whenever they arise, and given that um, we're able to see the question panel, uh, we'll just take questions as you have them based on the slide and be happy to address those as we go along. Otherwise, if you wanted to wait to the end to add the questions, we have uh, plenty of time um, set up after the presentation to address all the questions that you have. Um, today's presentation is on the elements of effective adolescent literacy instruction. And this is really at the forefront of everyone's um, mind, given the um, now the focus on reading next and on adolescent literacy and the notion that you get this sort of third grade um, slump, you know, where students after third grade end up having troubles with um, more difficult content area materials and so forth. And so this is a timely topic that seems to be at the forefront of everyone's mind. So we'll go ahead and, and get started. Um, there is a problem when you take a look at statistics primarily from the um, National Assessment of Educational Progress. And the problem is that, again, as I just mentioned, that students do struggle when text gets much more difficult. And that you'll end up seeing um, in middle school and high school. It, again, does get much more difficult in sort of that third grade and above or fourth grade and above um, area um, when when uh, text becomes more complex in terms of lexile levels um, and you have, of course, fewer pictures and so forth. So what we're finding is that U.S. students are struggling now with these tougher texts um, and being able to uh, handle um, seventh, eighth grade as an example in high school level um, textbooks and informational and narrative-based text. What you're finding is that it's about 67% um, of fourth and eighth grade students are reading less than a proficient level. And if you want to um, look at the definition of a proficient level, that just means for fourth graders that they're able to handle fourth grade level text with ease and understanding. And eighth grade level students um, are able to handle eighth grade level text with ease and understanding. And their, their students are struggling with this kind of text. And when you're looking at the kinds of assessment from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, what you're going to find is the students have a hard time reading text and then answering comprehension questions. For example, what's the main idea? What would be the best summarization statement? Picking out important details from text, um, determining um, what might be true or false about a text. Those kinds of things the students are um, in fact, struggling with. And so, um, again, big focus because that is a vast majority of students. Um, when it, you get into 12th grade, if students even make it to the 12th grade, because we're getting a number of students who are dropping out of school, 62% um, are below proficient. Again, they're not able to handle their grade level text with ease and understanding. Um, 40% of high school students don't have the literacy skills needed by employers. And then we're, again, getting this um, huge student dropout rate, um, well over a million students. And again, dropout rates do vary depending on, of course, um, states and districts. But uh, we're finding that we're um, graduating not as many students as we would like unfortunately, and the dropout rates are um, quite high. Uh, this cartoon just shows that, you know, sure, we do lose students, but who's counting? And, and not that we are looking at uh, or making, you know, light of the situation, but a number of high school students are dropout factories, and um, we need to make sure that all students are being considered, and of course that means starting earlier and teaching the kinds of skills and strategies needed so students will be much more successful. 
the uh, focus has always been on K-3, and if you have read the National Reading Panel Report in its entirety, congratulations, because that sure is a huge document. My favorite from the National Reading Panel was the summary, uh, but the summary did note the importance of um, K-1, 2, 3 uh, recommendations on how best to teach students to read. And then the other document that I personally like is the Put Reading First document, and that's Arm Brewster, Lear, and Osborne. It was revised in 2006. It, to me, is one of the very best uh, descriptions of how best to teach reading. It's very teacher friendly if you haven't looked at that. And my recommendation would be to just Google that, put Reading First 2006 from the National Institute for Literacy, and you should get that. But those two documents really emphasize the following, and I just want to make sure we're all on the same page with regard to that. Um, and that is that explicit and systematic instruction is needed in order to uh, teach reading at the highest possible level. And let's just make sure we're on the same page when we talk about explicit and systematic instruction. Explicit instruction has to do with um, teaching using I do, we do, you do, essentially, where there's a strong model. Students are given multiple opportunities to practice and to obtain feedback that uh, students then are given opportunities to uh, perform the skill on their own. So again, teaching in small steps, very clear teacher modeling and demonstration. The, the issue about feedback has to do with students are given opportunities to um, find out if they're doing it the right way or if they do need an error correction procedure. And then they, those skills are, are built upon and move into more complex skills. That's explicit instruction. Um, that, no matter what area you look at, was the best way of teaching reading. And then, of course, systematic has to do with uh, skills are um, taught in a logical sequence that, again, prerequisites are taught before more complex skills. But there is a logical order, and an order that would help students to be more successful, prevent errors, those kinds of things. So when you look at K-3, what you're going to find is that there are the big five elements of reading. And those big five elements of reading should be taught explicitly and systematically. And here they are. Again, um, they have been talked about. I'm sure you could say these in your sleep. But um, they include phonemic awareness, which has to do with the, the auditory part of um, sort of the pre-reading reading reading skills. And that has to do with, and I always tell my students that if you can do it in the dark, it's phonemic awareness. So it's, for example, saying the individual sounds in sun, and the student would say s, uh, n, or if I said listen, l, it, what's the word, and the student said lit, that uh, you could do it in the dark. You could close your eyes and you could come up with it. So phonemic awareness is absolutely critical. It's a part of phonological awareness. Um, two had to do with phonics instruction. Again, big focus on um, K3 phonics much more explicitly taught. And if you look at programs that McGraw-Hill has um, put an emphasis on, you're going to see uh, focus on sounds in isolation, oftentimes uh, sounds that are blended together, together to form words, uh, sounds and blending activities that are done in isolation. Those aspects are moved into connected text and so forth. So, Phonics instruction uh, hugely important to um, a solid program for K-3. You get into fluency building, which has to do with how quickly, accurately, and um, that you read, and of course with expression, very important for students. And then vocabulary has to do with the understanding of the words we read. And then you have comprehension, and that has to do with how well do you understand text. So, the big five for K-3, that's the emphasis that you'll see. And for K-1, you'll see much more phonemic awareness and phonics. And those tend to drop out as you move into grades 2 and 3. But what I wanted to make sure that everyone knew was that the elements of effective adolescent literacy instruction are different. You'll see commonalities. But they're different for grades 4 to 12. And you might say, well, why are we dropping down to grade 4? And the reason is that um, all of these 
um, research and uh, brochures or uh, research um, syntheses uh, all would categorize adolescent literacy as starting in grade four. And so grades four to 12 would be the uh, pinpointed years. And the ones that we've provided here are Reading Next, which by Ann Carosa and Snow are the authors. That is a very well-respected document, 2006. You've got the inter Interventions for Adolescent Struggling Readers, a great meta-analysis that talks about the big five for students in grades four to 12. You have Reading in the Disciplines, which really outlines the challenges that we face for adolescent uh, literacy. And then you've got the IES document on improving adolescent literacy and what practices we should use in the classroom. So you've got those four um, research analyses that I would recommend taking a look at if you want to know more about uh, adolescent literacy. But when you do read these documents, you're going to find the number one approach to working with, uh, with older kids is, guess what, explicit and systematic instruction. The same definition that we talked about before, explicit being very intentional, the teachers showing the kids, having the kids practice, having the kids do it on their own, and systematic just means that there's a logical order to the way we do business for older kids. But the big five are different, and so let's take a look, and we're going to go through each one of those uh, and give you examples based on some programs through McGraw-Hill that uh, should illustrate what those um, five are. The first is word study, and you didn't see that one before. You saw fluency before, and here it is again. You saw vocabulary before, and here it is again. And you saw comprehension before, here it is again. And here comes a new one, that's motivation. So the big five for K3 are, uh, as you'll see, different from 4 to 12. And really the differences zoom in on word study. Again, word study ramps it up for older kids. Less of a focus or diminished focus on the phonemic awareness and much more of a focus on phonics, but now into sound combinations and multisyllabic words. And then that new one down at the bottom, motivation, and as you uh, could probably imagine, uh, motivation is a key area for working with older kids. They come into these situations not as eager, perhaps, as um, younger students and, and oftentimes having experienced a great deal of failure and difficult reading their, their materials. So motivation has been at the forefront of working with older kids. So let's excuse me, let's spend a little bit of time on word study and make sure that we're all on the same page with regard to this important area. And element one would focus on reading at the word level. And as part of that, I just um, put in the corrective reading sounds. This would be one way of doing business. In, in my classes, I make sure that my students know their sounds, so they have to do sounds checks with me. I'm sure that's the high point of the class, um, but uh, it's important that you take a look at this. This is from the Corrective Reading Series Guide that um, you'll notice all the sounds and sound combinations that are utilized in the program are there. There are sample words um, that you would find those sounds in, and if the sound is held, for example, that would be continuous sounds like a ah or a, and then you have stop sounds like b or d as an example. And then the, the sounds for older kids are ramped up. So, you know, you're going to see sound combinations. AI uh, starts them, for example, and you'll see these various tougher sound combinations. My favorite is uh, like in could, um, that are taught, for example, in corrective reading. And so word study would say that we would zoom in on these sounds and in corrective, you know, they'll be underlined, so you would say what sound, oi, what word, boil, as an example. But that's a nice way of doing business. It's getting kids to um, zoom in and learn what, what those sounds are. And, of course, those will ramp up over time. So just to point out that that is a, a key part of uh, corrective reading as one example. Um, and here it is in, in a sample lesson. This would be at the very basic level, this is corrective reading decoding A, but what you'll find is with regard to word study that older kids, if they test into this level of the program, 
uh, would need to have a, a very basic um, introduction, quick introduction to the initial sounds. And so what you'll see here would be students practicing um, the sounds up in the, the top left-hand corner. Doing, and you'll see this phonemic awareness work where here it says, um, say the sounds, listen, see, and you're holding up a finger for each sound. But the students aren't reading anything. This is much more of a practice with regard to phonemic awareness as an example. And then the students are blending them together to form a word, much more phonics driven uh, for those students who need it. And in corrective, as I mentioned before, you're going to see the sort of the telescoping in on individual sounds or sound combinations. And once the student says the sound, then the student says the word. And this is a very effective strategy, again, for getting students to understand that words are made up of individual sounds and sound combinations. They practice those uh, with, in this uh, word attack box, reading words, introduce, uh, or there's an introduction to new words. And the key aspect of these programs is that then these words and sound combinations appear in the words and sound, uh, the words that would be um, read now as connected text. So again, a good example from a McGraw-Hill program. Then, of course, as students get to um, develop these sounds and sound combinations and begin to read at a higher level, there's a critical aspect that we need to ensure students know, and that is that students need to be able to read these tough multisyllabic words. And so in Read to Achieve, as an example, we teach the strategy of um, how do you decode a multisyllabic word. You underline all the vowel sounds, so you'll see the vowel, vowel sounds are underlined. You make a slash between the word parts so that each part has one vowel sound. Then you go back to the beginning of the word, and then you start to say the parts slowly but in order. So in inauguration, and then you read it fast, inauguration. And this, again, would be where it's the next step. The students have now learned their sounds and sound combinations and are reading um, much more quickly. But now we need to have them attack these big words that appear in content-rich text that students start to see really grades four on up. So just as a recap of word study, we're going to focus on individual sounds if the students need it. We're going to focus on sound combinations as the students become better at reading. The sound combinations will ramp up as students get better at reading. And then we really need to make sure that we focus in on multisyllabic words, those tough words that students will see as the text gets more complex. That's word study. All right, element two has to do with fluency. And this is, uh, would include three components. And I want to make sure that we say three components, because I was just in a school the other day, and um, they only said two. And I'll tell you which two those are. The um, important aspects are quickly, accurately, and with expression. And that's the one that the last part of it that I saw being left out. And the notion is that we need to make sure that students aren't reading quickly and running through all the punctuation uh, marks and not adding inflection and those kinds of things. The students, if they do read fluently, should be stopping at punctuation, should be adding inflection. Um, they should be um, reading with prosody, and that's the term for reading with expression. So it's quickly, accurately, and with expression, not reading like a robot. Um, and the best way of doing business for fluency building would be repeated oral reading. That means that you would read a piece of text repeatedly. And typically, the number of repeat reads, you're looking at about um, four repeat reads, as an example. Um, so the students would read it. And they have to read it out loud, so it's oral reading. Uh, and then they need to be able to get feedback with regard to their reading. So someone needs to listen to the student read, or, for example, it could be taped and the teacher listen um, at a later time. But the critical element would be the student does have to read out loud, and the student does need to receive feedback based on that read. And um, we, you would have word counts to facilitate that. You would count up the number of errors. You might say, well, what are the errors? And those would be anything that's not read the way it appears on the page. 
Um, and there are some exceptions. For example, if if um, proper nouns aren't read the right way, certain things may or may not count depending on, on who you talk to or what program you're in. But typically, if it's not um, stated the way it appears in the text, um, it would be an error. The one aspect that we want to make sure that would always be included would be a comprehension activity always tied to the fluency activity. Otherwise, students are focused on reading fast and not focused on reading fast and thinking about what they're reading. And those two go hand in hand. So in Read to Achieve, as an example, the students would practice reading this passage. They would read it on a Monday. Um, and that would be considered a cold timing because it's the first time that they would read it. They would um, do some practice with that same passage on a Tuesday. On a Wednesday, as an example, they might um, write down three things um, they've learned, or there might be a quiz, a little uh, multiple choice quiz that the students would take. Maybe Thursday they answer these three questions. The, the point being is that they do something with the fluency passage every single day. And then, let's say on a Friday, they would um, do what's called a hot timing. So if you count that up, uh, Monday through Friday, they have five times to read the same passage. And again, based on best practice, uh, right around four times would be best for students to develop fluency. Um, and here's an example of what might appear on like a Wednesday in Read to Achieve, where the students answer multiple choice questions. And then they write a little um, evidence statement about um, answering a question based on the text. So the point being here is that it's always important to add comprehension activities when you're doing fluency building. This is the famous Hasbrook and Tyndall um, guidelines on where students should fall or where students did fall during, based on their field tests. But if you're looking at um, older kids, so just zoom in on grade four here through grade eight um, up through middle school, what you're going to see is you've got the percentile of 90, 75, 50, 25, and 10. And these uh, would be where students would fall if you're at the 90th percentile, where it's correct per minute, it's around 145. And you can kind of get an idea for fall, winter, spring and then the average weekly improvement of number of words. So it gives you an idea here about what we're looking at with regard to student performance. And Jan Hasbrook has always indicated that students who are below the 50th percentile when it comes to um, this table, those students typically are in need of some kind of fluency building program. That essentially when you're looking at the 50th percentile and above, and you, you're trying to decide what to focus on in terms of intervention, probably those kinds of kids who are at least at the 50th percentile, you can spend more time on vocab and comp. Um, again, if you've got the time to do more practice and fluency, that's great, but that's sort of the minimum level. This is just an example, again, from Read to Achieve, and that shows the cold timing and the cold timing here would be graphed first. That's, for example, what would happen on a Monday. And then you would put the hot timing up at the, uh, above the blue column there. So then you've got the hot timing. And, and it, typically, I don't know if I've ever seen an example otherwise, but um, typically when students have read the passage four additional times, that the hot timing is graphed above the blue timing there because right they've gotten a lot more practice and so you can mark down how fast the student has read the student can uh, uh, or the student can graph that this, um, down at the bottom did I improve yes and did I meet my goal well it depends on what the goals are normally if you're below the black line your goal is the black line and the, this would be the 50th 75 and 90th percentile based on the Hasbrook and Tyndall data and there's, um, this, these would be various goals that the student can shoot for. So in, in sort of recapping what you want to do with fluency, the notion would be that students should be reading um, text. Typically, the, the, the text in the program is at the student's um, independent level for fluency building. The um, student would be repeat reading, and we're looking at a minimum of four times. We want to make sure that, um, that errors are, the student is given feedback 
on the, based on their reading of the passage, not during the timing, but when the timing is finished. That there are comp activities always tied to the fluency passage so that students can, for example, write a descriptive um, analysis or answer multiple choice questions based on that. And that we do some kind of um, cold timing, hot timing, and have students graph it. Those would be best practices with regard to fluency. All right, along comes element three, vocabulary. This again from Read to Achieve. One um, good way of doing business with regard to vocabulary would be to um, write down a tough word. The uh, easiest way of doing business with vocabulary would be read around the word to see if you can figure out what it means. So that's context clues. If you can't, then you should go to the glossary. If the book has a glossary and you need to teach students what a glossary is, if you can't find it in the glossary, perhaps look it up in a dictionary or look it up in an online dictionary. This would be called a word learning strategy because it is helpful no matter what word you can give kids, that at least they've got a way of determining what does the word mean. So very important to teach students so that they can go out and become much more independent with regard to whatever text they um, happen to be reading. One important aspect of um, vocabulary instruction, it's sort of, uh, to me, one of the most important um, things to remember about vocabulary is that anytime you see a word that's a tough word for a kid, you always want to define those tough words that we would call tier two or tier three words, tier three being science and social studies specific as an example. Always define those words with words that the kids know. That would be tier one words or student friendly words. So if you've got benevolent, which I would call a tier two word, you could say it means good. Good would be a word that they would use right whenever they talk or more of a tier one word. Jovial, I would call that a tier two word means happy. A merchant, which you might say, oh, you know, a merchant might appear in a social studies text. You might call that a tier three word, um, would be defined as a person who buys and sells lots of things. Notice each word in that definition would be in the student's repertoire. It'd be easy for the student to understand. Here we have the word reluctant that I would probably call a tier two word. Reluctant means not sure you really want to do something. Now, a violation. So a violation of reluctant might be, uh, defining reluctant as experiencing trepidation, not a good way of defining it. Or tenacity, the state of being tenacious, not a good way to define it. That would, you know, a student can memorize that, but it's not helpful in the least bit to help a student be able to understand what the word means in, in um, context. So with regard to vocabulary, if you, you know, ever see that, these tough words always should be defined in student-friendly language. And as an example, Read to Achieve does do that uh, with regard to you know, student understanding. And you'll see that in other direct instruction programs as well. So again, capping, uh, sort of a recap on vocab would be to um, target tough words, have the students read around the words, context clues, have the students look in a glossary if they don't know, have the students look in dictionaries. Those would be word learning strategies. And then always being mindful to take the tough words and define them with kid-friendly words so that the student can truly understand what they mean. Okay, important for um, understanding text. Comprehension, that one gets probably the most play element for, and that has to do with being able to understand what you read. So let's go through this. These um, slides are from Read to Achieve. And um, this one, making connections and activating prior knowledge is very, very, uh, you, you'll, you'll see this a lot in much more constructivist oriented classrooms and, you know, hey, we, we should spend more time with that, getting students more actively engaged in making connections. So I don't disagree with that. I think it's important to make sure that students know what the topic of the lesson is, what's their purpose for reading something, let's say it's informational based. And then what do you know about the topic? And getting students interested in the topic by exploring what they know about it as an example. And those kinds of things are uh, written down and students talk about them. So again, very important to get students interested in what the topic is about. 
graphic organizers, the, the research on graphic organizers, when you look at effect sizes, uh, and that would be how big of a change do you make in student performance when you implement um, this particular um, strategy. And you get effect sizes that are well over a, a one, which essentially means that um, you're looking over a standard deviation difference for students when you implement graphic organizers. And again, from Read to Achieve, we use a lot of graphic organizers in the program. The reason being it really helps students to organize their thoughts. The students um, see it, so there's a visual aspect. The students talk about it, so there's an auditory aspect. And then the students fill them in, so there's a tactile kinesthetic aspect. And so all three modalities of learning are strengthened by the use of one very simple graphic organizer. So we use them for various types of text structure, whether it's compare and contrast or cause and effect or um, order sequence as an example. And I, you'll see those in science books and social studies books, uh, and they're just a nice way of being able to take notes to organize um, learning. Comprehension monitoring strategies. This one is surprising to me because I remember um, asking um, our son when he was in fifth grade. Uh, he said he read something in class and he didn't understand what he read. And I said, well, what do you do when you read something that you, um, you don't understand? And he said, well, I raised my hand to ask my teacher. And I said, but what could you do while you're waiting to talk to your teacher? And he just, you know, he had no idea that you should, as an example, uh, reread it. And, uh, you know, read it slower and stop and think through what you just read. And so as part of Read to Achieve, we teach what's called comprehension monitoring, that when you're reading tough text, you might slow down, as an example. If you get to the bottom of a paragraph or even at the end of a sentence, you might say, wait a minute, I don't, I don't know what I just read. I'm going to go back and reread that. And, and after rereading it, you ask yourself, you know, does that make sense? So that's an important strategy that you should teach explicitly to students. And you'll notice in Read to Achieve this Think Aloud box, and that's very much um, indicative of explicit instruction, that you have the teacher model what goes on inside your head as you're learning a new skill. Question generation is a, a critical strategy to also improve comprehension, and that has to do with generating literal questions. So who, what, where, when, why, and how. The students are given the frames and taught how to do the questions, and then they get to generate their own questions as the program progresses, again, from Read to Achieve. One that you don't hear a lot about, but I think it's a mistake if you don't do it, and that's teaching kids how to generate infer inferential questions. We need to get kids thinking that you know text is much more than just asking them uh, to find the answer in text, and that has to do with you might need to think and search for the answer. You might need to think, what is the author trying to tell me? Um, and so that has to do with questions like, how do you think blank felt when blank happened? Or why would the character act this way? Or how would the story have changed if something happened? Or come up with something else that you, when you're reading the text, you thought about that you could question someone about. So question generation is a, um, an important aspect of um, Read to Achieve as one example. Another strategy would be mnemonics. Mnemonics work well when you have a list of many things to do, and it's hard to remember all the different parts. So what you do is you use it as a little frame, and then you just hang your knowledge along the frame. So here we've got SQ3R, which appears in Read to Achieve. And SQ3R stands for Survey, Question, Read, Reflect, Review. And that has to do with getting kids to look at, for example, a science chapter. You survey the chapter. You read the sidebars. You look at the graphics. You read the questions at the end. You get a good idea about what you're going to be reading about in the chapter. The question would be taking the headings, turning them into questions, and then reading to answer the question. That would be both the question and the read. Reflecting, going over your notes, making sure that um, you, your notes are clear, and um, 
actually relating to those notes. How does that relate to what you've read, things you've experienced? And then reviewing it over time in case you have quizzes or tests, for example. And then we've got the QHL, which just stands for um, Question, How, and Learn. And that would be getting kids to go beyond the text to look up um, answers to questions that they had when they were reading. So again, much more of a, a science, social studies rich kind of strategy. Note taking, uh, to me, is one of the most important things you can teach kids because even college students don't know how to take notes. And it's not their fault. I mean, they've never been taught. So getting kids to have a note-taking strategy is critical. Again, we teach it in Read to Achieve. And that has to do with more of a Cornell approach where the student um, takes the heading, turns it into a question, and notes the page number. And then when the student reads a section of the text and finds the answer, then you write the answer on the right-hand side. The nice thing about this would be that you can fold the paper, and then you can use this as a study guide. So once the paper is folded, you read the prompt, and then you answer it, and then you turn to the other side and check your answer. Or you can look at the answer, and then try to come up with the question that it would answer. So it's a nice sort of double-sided um, study guide um, for students. And we should also say that the students should be taught about how to take notes during lecture. A lot of students try to write down every single word that you say. And so in Read to Achieve, we teach students how to take um, notes during the lecture. So both types of note taking, both from the text and from lecture, are used. Um, another important strategy that students do struggle with is summarization. And summarization has to do with uh, pinpointing the most important or the big ideas of the text. In Read to Achieve, we teach retell, which would, of course, be a retelling of what happened first, next, then finally, as an example. But we zoom in on three parts, and it's called the gist, and it's very well researched. And that is, when you read something, you find out who or what was the excerpt about, what was the most important thing about that, whom or what, when you've been reading. And then what you need to do is you need to write it in 20 words or less. Nice thing about that is that it gets kids to be much more concise because uh, students will really struggle pick, picking out the most important details and then trying to say that in as few words as possible. So a good summarization strategy should be taught to students, and that just helps them pinpoint sort of the main idea of what they've read. Higher order thinking skills should always be a key part of any program. Read to Achieve, you'll see these little pyramids. and um, you'll find that remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating are noted by the lesson. So you know that the uh, taxonomy is moving uh, to higher levels as you move through the program. Uh, so let's just recap uh, comprehension. Again, comprehension really focuses on skills that we teach kids. It does have to do with understanding what you're reading, but we need to teach kids how to understand what they're reading. And the best way of doing that would be teaching strategies like generating questions and answering them and summarizing text and taking notes based on what you hear from lecture and from textbooks and making connections and activating prior knowledge. Those are much more active kinds of procedures that we would actually teach kids so that then they would understand what they read at a higher level. And then along comes motivation, which we probably all will smile when we think about older kids and, you know, their motivation levels are not as high as they should be. So we need to think about how are we going to get these students engaged and motivated so that they'll want to read and want to be a part of cooperative learning groups and part of the class. Um, we need to make sure our topics are interesting. Now, this is from, uh, this uh, picture is from Phineas Gage in Read to Achieve. And um, one thing that Ron and I did uh, was that we went into classrooms and we asked kids to choose the stories that they wanted uh, to have included in Read to Achieve. And we explained the importance. And um, without a doubt, no matter what class we went to, whether it was the at-risk kids or the honors kids or regular English classes, no matter what class we went to, the story of Phineas Gage was the number one story that the kids wanted to know about. All the kids wanted to read 
the story about the guy who had the pole go through his head. So it kind of made us laugh, but right, it motivated students. And so we want to make sure that our topics are interesting um, as we possibly can to get students wanting to read more about it. Another approach to getting students actively engaged is something called reciprocal teaching. And that is a key part of Redo Achieve for the narrative portion. And that has to do with lots of dialogue and getting kids to work in small groups. And what we do in Redo Achieve is we teach each one of these skills and then we put them all together to form an overall multiple strategy that students then can use with each kid taking a role along with a facilitator of the group. And so students learn how to make a prediction, they learn how to summarize, they learn how to generate questions, and they learn how to clarify words that they don't know. So there's explicit um, instruction that's provided on each one of these. And again, they're folded into one grand strategy. The nice thing about that is it's letting students take uh, ownership over their own learning but we don't put them in groups until they know each of those four elements and can be um, successful doing that. Very hands-on activities. Again, in Read to Achieve, we do something called Think, Pair, Share. And um, that's a, a very popular kind of approach that you'll see in, in lots of literacy uh, or apprenticeship endeavors. And Think, Pair, Share just says, OK, we're going to pose a question to you. We're going to have you think about it. We're going to have you partner up and pair up and talk about the question, develop a response, and then share it with the class. And so that's Think, Pair, Share. What we tried to do was to come up with really cool, interesting kinds of scenarios that kids could really um, get into and explore and come up with some cool kinds of um, ideas. So here's one. Suppose you're a director for a movie based on the book Trial by Ice, apply, which is one of our Bloom's taxonomy words, apply your knowledge of the characters and the setting in the book to determine who should star in your movie, which part each will play, and where your movie will be filmed, defend your answer. So again, you've got to really have a good knowledge of this if you're going to come up with, you know, who's going to star in your movie, and what's the part that that person will play, and where is your movie going to be filmed? You really do have to have a good, solid understanding of um, the book in order to um, put the answer down on, on paper. Again, you're collaborating with a partner. So in recapping this, uh, or let me just recap motivation. Motivation, interesting topics, and lots of student discussion where um, students are actively engaged in a group, but only when they have the skills to be there. Um, but in recapping this talk, what, what we want to make sure that we focus in on would be um, best practices based on the research. And again, we noted that we do have these four research um, syntheses that are out there where um, best practices are noted. But they have to um, hinge on or do hinge on explicit and systematic instruction. And they focus on word study, on fluency building, on vocabulary, on comprehension, and on motivation. And if, a, if you have a solid um, adolescent literacy program, you should find all elements covered in the program. And again, that would uh, meet the needs of students in grades 4 to 12. So that is the um, end of our presentation, but we wanted to have uh, time to be able to have questions from you or any thoughts or, or any um, issues you wanted to talk about. And I haven't seen any questions pop up as of yet. And I'll just say, you know, we've been using um, Read to Achieve quite a bit, but uh, uh, another program coming down the pike that I'm sure that you're all well aware of or hearing about is um, Flux Literacy. And you'll find the elements of effective adolescent literacy instruction to be a key component of, of that program, particularly on element number five, which is motivation. 
if you want to get kids motivated, put them in front of a computer. And not only that, but put them in front of a computer where you've got really cool and interesting um, cartoon-based vignettes and um, sort of the computerized aspects of learning, getting students to respond and get immediate feedback based on their response. So in that way, the computer is a, certainly a motivating element. And you know another one, because there is a print-based component to that, would be reading really interesting text. And notice that in the print-based component of Flex, that you're going to have students collaborating and talking about text and grappling with the issues with regard to text. So, you know, in that way, the motivation is um, capitalized uh, in, in the print-based component. And then let's not forget there's a project-based component where students do really cool projects that um, extend students' learning. So talk about, I mean, again, you've got word study, vocab, comp. Um, and fluency building as key parts of flex, but it's the motivation one to me that is really um, sort of the mainstay of that particular program. So I thought I'd put a plug in for flex one more time. And we're just waiting on any questions or comments that anyone has. Well, if there's no other comments or questions, uh, I would say this concludes our talk on adolescent literacy. Hopefully, you took something from this pre presentation. And uh, if you do have questions, we put our email. That's our home email. And uh, Ron and I would be very, very happy to respond to any of your comments, questions, concerns anything that you have. So please take us up on that. And uh, if you have any questions on Read to Achieve or we can certainly address anything with regard to um, Flex, we'd be happy to uh, help in any way we can. We really appreciate um, you being a part of this webinar. And we've got another one coming up on Thursday on um, the Common Core. And then there's one um, next week on um, going beyond the book. So that's much more focused on college readiness. So hopefully we'll see you then. Thank you very much. Thank you.